Start the recording. Yep. Hi, and welcome back to Affirmative Action Presents, API celebration of arts and culture. I'm joined now by Snea Shrestha, aka Imagine, who's this amazing street artist around the Boston area. You can see her murals right down the street from our very own studio in Central Square. She's has work all over Boston, including in the MFA and the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. She's done collaborations with Reebok and Facebook and Red Bull, all kinds of really exciting things. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? Thanks for those generous introductions. Thanks, thanks so much for giving us your time. You know, first off, I just wanna ask, what does being Asian and Asian American mean to you? Hmm. Good question. I think for me, it is about keeping my traditions and culture close to my heart and presenting the most authentic version of myself in my artwork. Because my work is, you know, it's, most of it is public art. And so I feel enormous amount of, not burden, I wanna say response. Not but at least be where I grew up. And I think um, that's what really, you know, being Asian for me means. Hmm. I mean, like, it, it, there is no one right answer, you know. It is such a huge yeah. group of, even within the Asian countries, you know, to be Japanese or Chinese, you know, it is so everyone's experience with their identity is so different. So you were born and raised yeah. in Nepal. Yeah. Right? I was when born did you and first raised in Nepal? When did you first come yeah, to I, America? Um I came to the US for college first. Mm -hmm. So my first experience ever was leaving home at like 17. And being in the US for the first time um, and being a freshman in at mm -hmm. um, Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So, what was yeah. that kind of culture shock like? You know, was it very <laughs> different from what you were used to? It was. It was. I mean, um, I, I want to go back to the Asian thing too. Mm -hmm. uh, what you mentioned is, you know, it's impossible to represent everybody at the same time through one person. What Asian means. And I also want to express that, like, it is connected to our identities and our personal experiences in so many ways, like, even down to something as, you know, simple as, like, what people think Asian looks like or Asians should look like. And I've personally struggled with it because I don't check the boxes of what America's definition of Asian looks like. And so I'm given these other these identities because of like my big curly hair which like I'm not wearing now but like big curly hair or like skin tone like all these things and you know people feel like they're giving me a compliment but in reality you're erasing my identity you're negating my identity and I think we owe it to ourselves to express our most authentic self so that you know at least we're strong for ourselves and we're representing ourselves um going back to your question um well what was it after you asked about the, about the US? yeah it was essentially mm -hmm. like what was culture like what was the culture shock kind of like going from nepal to the u.s for the first time you know by yourself sure. Sure, yeah. Um, culture shock was major. So like, first of all, just as a regular teenager, right? Like in Nepal, schools go from first grade to like 12th grade in the same school. So like I was in the same school from third grade to 12th grade. So I basically grew up in that school. And then here I am after, you know, being a teenager growing up in the same place in a new school. So that's already sort of like an uncomfortable situation for a teenager who wants to be cool or like known or, you know, familiar. And so that was already sort of scary. And then, of course, moving to a new country, my country, we've been shocked 
And I grew up speaking English and Nepali, but I didn't speak American English. I didn't have an American accent. So like all of a sudden I felt like my speech was like taken away. Like I didn't speak as much. I was a really outgoing kid in high school. But then once I came to the US, my first two years was totally sort of spent invisible. And I also didn't um, identify with the Greek culture there. And I didn't know what Greek culture meant until I was there. And so it was just easy through the culture shock and supported me through all of that. So I'm really thankful for that. Um, and then junior and senior year was pretty amazing there. Um, but yeah, I think the culture shock of, I don't think I was able to make friendships that well back then. I don't have a lot of friends from college that I'm really close with because I was just trying to adapt, trying to be a person, um, let alone, you know, build friendships. Mm. Um, so yeah, I had like three jobs and study times so and then i would be doing all, all the clubs all the asian club international club all these things studying abroad and all that so experience overall was great but i think like the quintessential sort of college experiences weren't there but i made it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you're doing things uh it's interesting you talked about that kind of invisibility you felt because that is such a part of the Asian identity, the fact that we are in this country, but we're not quite Americans, but we're not quite, I mean, you actually are Asian, but a lot of Asian Americans are not actually Asian. And like, it's so striking mm -hmm. about your work is kind of the, the public nature of it. It is very present. It's out there in the world and visible, you know? Can you talk a bit about both how you got started mm -hmm. in kind of the graffiti and mural world and how you feel about like the visibility of the art, the, the public nature of it compared to say the gallery stuff you've done. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, I started, I want to say, I mean, I was painting since forever, since I was five and I was painting in college too, but I really felt like I came into my voice and was attached to this or found this identity through my art when I was um, introduced to graffiti when I was working at a nonprofit um, in Boston. I was in Manhattan. That's where I met Rob was at the time. And now he's my family and my mentor for life. And he was painting almost every other weekend. And on Monday, you know, you'd been on the weekend and on Monday, he'd be showing us photos and I was so intrigued and I was doing photography at the time. So I asked him if I could tag along, take photos. And over time, I, I found myself doing sketches of different letters and what I love about set. It's an art form, A, that was based out of rebellion, out, out of his need of being seen. And then two, it's art from that's letters, like problems. So I wasn't studying about it in college. I didn't grow up around it. So I studied when really you used it. I was studying it as an art form. I was talking to as many people as I could. Rob gave me like two huge tote bags full of graffiti zines and magazines. And that's how I sort of familiarized me, myself with like what graffiti was. And I love the fact that it's an art form based on letters. The more unique you are, the more stylistic you are in showing your personality through your letters. Like that's how good you are. And I love that. Like the uniqueness you know, is what makes you good, not necessarily copying um, another artist, which is what I grew up doing in in art classes and so so I started you know writing like letters like drawing letters in English but then over time I was thinking you know I liked it and I had a good control of spray can at that time but I started thinking to myself you know where is my voice in this other than my obsession with this art form where am I in this am I just trying but I was trying to figure out where am I in this and then Rob and I talked about uh, 
writing in Nepali. And when I started writing in Nepali, like, it came so naturally to me to style I wrote English. And so it comes more naturally to me. And that's how it started. From then on, there was sort of no going back. Um, and I was writing in Nepali. The second part of your question in terms of visibility, I love the scale of the work that I get to create because it does make me feel seen in a way that I don't know if I otherwise would have in that uh, Personally, I'm not a very loud sort of like, I'm pretty shy and like pretty cool. And for me, that's really powerful to me. I feel like I can help through my artwork without having to compromise who I am, my personality. What about? Oh no, I think I missed you. Oh, yeah. um, you were, you were buffering you a bit up? and kind of stuttering, but you're back now. Uh, you were saying something about the nature of public art. Right. So the nature of public art, is, you know, it's public. It's there for everybody to see. And for me, like, the scale of the work that I get to create is what really makes me feel seen because, you know, I'm not a super loud sort of person. I'm, I'm pretty shy. I'm not very loud. or You know, the, I never felt like I had, like, that presence of, like, that demanded attention. Um, but I still wanted to be seen. And it felt like, and I still feel, and I know that my art can be loud for me. So for me, without uh, compromising my personality and who I am, I can still present my authentic self through my art. And it's also a way of sort of, in time, it's become a way of reclaiming space in a way where I've felt like, I belong here too, you know, and here's my artwork. And this is so alien looking to most people, but I still deserve to be seen in the same way that, you know, if you see a person who looks different and speaks a different language, even if you don't understand each other, you can still appreciate each other's humanity and respect each other for it. And that's what I aim to do with my artwork is that, no, you, I know you can't read the Nepali script that's on it, but you can still appreciate the aesthetics of a culture and ask questions about what it says. Um, and that's the sort of, um, you know, objective of my work. And I've been able to do that. Um, so I'm really thankful for the kind of artwork that I got to stumble into and, and create public artwork that, that, like that. Yeah, so you talked a bit about the ways you're bringing your kind of Nepali influences into this American art. And obviously a lot of it features this very distinct Sanskrit lettering type with the, the broad brush strokes. Can you talk a bit about kind of your artistic process with bringing those two influences together? Sure, yeah. So the, the, the script that I write in, the, the, the lettering is called Devanagari script. And so Devanagari is a writing form that is written, like you can write Sanskrit in it, and Nepali is also written in it. So sometimes I write in Sanskrit, and then sometimes I write in Nepali. The aesthetics of it come from various, like 14th century manuscripts that I've researched um, and looked at, um, manuscripts from Nepal that I've looked at. Um, other influences also come from temple inscriptions um, that tell the story of that time or of that king or raja at that time and I love the fact that you know I'm telling my own story and maybe the story of my people to a certain extent through what I'm writing or it's something that I, that I can offer the community that I'm writing that for um, and I see it as a similar sort of art form of um, narrating something that's in our lives that's authentic that's real that's happening um, and so the process is, is quite meditative. Over time, it became like a meditation, mindfulness, um, marriage between like painting and my mindfulness practice. So 
meditating for me is about regulating your breath and having control of it in a way that feels focused but not forced right and so when I'm painting a lot of people tell me oh your brush strokes are so perfect or so you know to make it perfect or to make it look the same what I do is regulate my breath and so the amount of pressure that's on the top part of the brush is this, is different than on the bottom part of the brush stroke and so when I regulate my breath in the same pattern every time I get the same strokes and so and it's also really it feels fulfilling it doesn't feel stressful when I'm painting when I'm doing the act of painting it doesn't feel stressful it feels very free and feels amazing and so I think that's how I'm able to sort of continue doing what I do too because my process is so entwined with my mindfulness practice mm -hmm. um and then in terms of a lot of people ask me like what I write on the walls it really depends on the space like every piece is um site specific so like for example the one that you mentioned the one in central square um the i think it's like five or six stories tall mit building in central square that one is a quote from a nepali poem that speaks about um success and this idea of meritocracy and so the quote goes you know success or roughly translated it goes success is uh, not where you come from, but where your heart is. And so it speaks to the idea of meritocracy. And then, you know, I'm thinking about this building being at the confluence of like this immigrant community that's the, uh, the Cambridge port, the mom and pop stores, so many of them that used to be on that um, Cambridge Square strip. And then they're like the high tech, like, uh companies in kendall square and then there's kids at mit who are from all over the world and so what does the definition of success look like and i was myself at a point in my life where i was thinking you know have i made it you know is this success and at that time i don't think a lot of people back home had caught up or understood what i was doing and so while here in the us it felt like people appreciated me for what i was doing I wasn't quite sure if the same translated back home and having approval from one side of my life wasn't enough where I came from the approval from there mattered too because I belong to that community no matter how much I say it doesn't matter it matters and so I was thinking you know well is this success and I was wondering how maybe at the end of the day we define success for ourselves and you know an immigrant community will define their own success. Nobody else gets to tell them what success looks like. Nobody gets to tell the mom and pop store what success looks like. Um, and so that's an, or MIT students from all over the world, maybe some from really wealthy backgrounds and maybe some from not very wealthy backgrounds that are, you know, first gen college graduates. And so I was thinking of that. And so that was very site specific. So what I write on the walls really depends on where I'm at. Um, but yeah, that's sort of my process in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. I mean, again, every artist has a completely different process for how they create, and I always like just to learn about those processes just to see because it's so reflective of the art that people make, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I just, I also want to talk a bit about your uh, educational work because you, you talked about success both here in Nepal and part of that success for you at least has been in, in giving back to those communities and helping bring up the next generation of artists. Can you talk a bit about your work in education? Sure. Um, so back in 2013, I quit my job here in Boston and moved to Nepal to open the sounds <laughs> open the first children's art museum in nepal and the idea came out of you know working on artists for humanity for a few years and seeing the impact that art has on young people sort of experiencing that firsthand i was working as a painting studio mentor and i was you know working with these kids and helping them in ways that like it was all through art and they might not and they, you know, we weren't expecting them to become artists 
at the end of the day, but through art, the process of creating art is really helpful for them to find themselves. And so I was like, you know, wow, there are so many kids, including my brother at that time, the same age as the teenagers that I was working with at Extra Humanity. I was thinking, wow, like we need this back home. We don't have any sort of facility that looks at art as a form of personal expression, as a means of learning. Um, art is mostly a skill-based thing. Um, and there are very strict criteria on like whether you're good or not. And I realized that like for me, art has helped me through my life through all these different phases. And that was, you know, because I felt like I found my way of personal expression, not necessarily because I was good at it. Um, and so I wanted to build a space like that. And I can't say that in Nepal, like my schooling, it was one of the best schools in Nepal, but I wasn't, I don't think I enjoyed learning my school career. I think I only enjoyed reading and learning and doing my homework. Like first when I came to college, like that's hell of a long time to not enjoy your schooling. And so I was out to create learning experiences that was fun for kids. That, that felt like their identity wasn't erased. That didn't make them feel nervous and scared, you know? And so from that, the idea of a children's museum came about. Um, and so I started building that in 2013. And since like we were going on till COVID, but because of COVID, we're sort of on a hiatus right now because in Nepal, it's still not safe enough to operate fully because people aren't vaccinated. Um, and it, there aren't enough vaccines uh, there. But yeah, till then we've you know worked with, with over like twenty thousand children, and you know we made art with over twenty thousand children. And after running the museum for a few years, I came back to Boston and uh, got my master's degree from Harvard in like arts education. Um, leadership and creative technologies and so that further helped me to develop the museum and basically the objective of the museum is to help children develop you know 21st century skills through art making and uh, coincidentally I'm, I'm like drinking from our children's art museum <laughs> um, but yeah um, so it comes really out of a personal passion and not, it didn't start off as like a career thing but I do feel like it's one of those things that make me feel whole that I am nurturing not only my past self but also future kids to be able to express themselves yeah yeah and just uh, to close it out because we are coming up on a half hour here uh what work of art in Boston gives you the most fulfillment it, it can be your own work it can be someone else's work but like what what work of art in the city do you like the best essentially i <laughs> there's so many but i gotta say the, the first one that popped in my mind is rob gibbs's um breed life series it's his murals it's not just one it's three murals he's actually painting one right now at the dewey square uh, wall at south station um and i think you know that his work is the epitome of what I think personal expression and public art should be. It's the perfect balance. Ooh. Windy, sorry. It's a perfect balance of um, what he believes in and what a lot of people need to see on a large stage, on a, la a large platform. Um, the one that he's painting right now is of his daughter, uh, beside a boom box and it's the best thing ever and I don't think a lot of families of color grow up seeing their children or little kids don't grow up seeing themselves on these large beautiful platforms and so in Boston especially like it's time and he's leading the way and yeah his mural is one of my favorites yeah that's that's so awesome to hear I encourage everyone watching this to go check it. Where can you find them, the series? 
Um, so the, the one that he's painting right now is a De Dewey Square. So if you go to South Station, there's this huge, beautiful wall. Um, and he's, you know, painting there right now. Gotcha. Sounds great. And you can see Imagine's work all over the city as well. Thank you much for so much for taking the time to join me. You can see all of her amazing mural work at uh, Imagine 876. Is that the number? Mm -hmm. Imagine 876 on all social medias, more or less. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for taking the time to join me and talking to me. This was a great conversation. And I uh, wish you the best with all your incredible work. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nate. Thanks for inviting me to do this. And it was great uh, being here.